So before we actually start the lecture today, I just want to kind of drive home the point here that the whole first half of this semester is the molecular biology portion of the course. So this whole first half of the semester is focused entirely on all DNA-related processes. That includes replication, DNA repair. Uh, it also includes the expression of genes, regulation of genes, etc. So to understand those DNA-related processes, you first have to have a very thorough and overall understanding of the molecule of DNA. And that was the whole point of lecture number one and lecture number two, to give everyone a nice, thorough understanding of the DNA molecule. Those first two lectures were meant to lay down a foundation or a groundwork of overall knowledge about DNA, and we're going to build on that knowledge starting today. So if you struggled with those first two lectures, if there was any content there that was confusing to you, if there was anything that didn't make sense, I strongly encourage you to please come see me immediately, schedule an appointment or come to office hours so we can get those concepts clear and make sure that you'll be successful on the rest of the whole first half of this semester. So keep in mind that to do well on the whole first half of this course, you really have to understand DNA inside and out. And make sure you did that, please. So moving on to today's lecture, today we're going to focus entirely on DNA replication. We'll talk about how cells copy their genomes in preparation for mitosis and cell division. However, unlike a genetics course, we're going to approach replication from the molecular perspective. We'll talk about the protein machines that replicate DNA and spend a lot of time on the mechanisms by which DNA is replicated. So this is the first half of chapter 6, pages 197 to 210. Today we'll start off talking about base pairing yet again. We'll review the rules of base pairing and talk about how that's involved in replication explicitly. We'll define what an origin of replication is and talk a little bit about replication forks, what happens at replication forks and why they exist. We'll discuss and define the lagging strand and the, lag and the leading strand of replication and tell you what that's all about. We'll go over the very amazing process of proofreading during replication. The cell can actually recognize mistakes that it has made during DNA replication and then go back and fix those mistakes in real time. We'll discuss RNA primers and tell you why those are important. We'll bring the whole idea together and go over a, a very broad but detailed overview of DNA replication as an entire process. And then we'll end the lecture with a discussion of telomeres, which are chromosome caps, and the enzyme telomerase, which is responsible for making telomeres. So the name of chapter 6 in your textbook is DNA Replication, Repair, and Recombination. And although this might sound like some kind of potpourri where the authors took three completely random topics and threw them together into a chapter, and that's actually not true. Any change to a DNA sequence is considered a mutation. Any deviation from the expected sequence of a genome is a mutation. Yes, some very small microscopic percentage of mutations can benefit the organism. They can provide an added fitness to the individual, benefit the species, and those are the drivers of evolution. But the vast, vast majority of mutations are detrimental, and they lead to a decreased fitness of the individual. They hurt that mutant individual, and um, they are weeded out by the process of natural selection. So, because so, muta so many mutations are bad and detrimental to the individual, cells actually have a huge number of different pathways they use to stop mutations from occurring. And cells work very, very hard to keep DNA what we call faithfully copied, meaning the new molecules of DNA that are made uh, identically mirror the old, so that there are no mutations, no changes in that DNA sequence. The process of DNA replication exists to make sure that DNA genomes are faithfully copied, making as few mistakes in the DNA copying as possible. There are also processes of repair that exist to find these mutations when they occur. So even though the cell works so hard to make sure no mistakes are made during replication, every once in a rare while, mistakes are still made. And so there are d DNA repair mechanisms that exist to find these mistakes, isolate them, and then fix them, and revert them back to the normal uh, unmutated sequence. The process of DNA recombination is almost a mechanism where the cell says this piece of DNA has so many mistakes on it that we're just going to throw the whole thing away and we're going to start from scratch and make a brand new copy of DNA that basically gets rid of all those mistakes in one shot. So kind of a brute force uh, way of repairing DNA with mutations where you throw it away and try again. But again, the, the point of DNA recombination is to generate a new, faithfully copied segment of DNA. So hopefully, as you can see, the three processes that this chapter is about are far from 
random, they are intimately related, DNA replication, repair, and recombination all exist to make sure that DNA is faithfully copied and mutations are kept to a minimum. <clears throat> so, the essence of DNA replication is actually possible because of base pairing. The rules of base pairing allow DNA replication to be. When we met, met in class after lecture one, when we did the in-class component of the lecture one material, we used one of those study questions to explicitly discuss how the rules of base pairing give DNA this property of being intrinsically replicatable. You probably remember that DNA is a double-stranded anti-parallel molecule that exists as a double helix, and bases are paired. A's base pair with T's and G's base pair with C's. However, if we pull two strands of DNA apart, what we are left with are two single strands, but each of those single strands can act as a template, allowing a new strand of DNA to be made, which is complementary to the first because of these rules of base pairing. When this is done with two original strands of DNA, the result of this process is two new double-stranded molecules of DNA, which both are identical to the first. So this is the figure from your textbook showing this, but this figure kind of uses more of a color coding for the bases rather than the letters. So I found this figure online, and I think it does a little bit of a more intuitive job of showing it. On the left, you'll see double-stranded DNA, and the sequence is what the sequence is on those two strands. You can pull those two strands apart and begin synthesizing new complementary strands for each of them. So you see here at the bottom of this strand there was a G, and of course C's base pair with G's, so we put a C across from it. We'll put an A next to that to base pair with this T. Up here a G should go, and then next a T, and next a C, and then an A. You're doing the same exact process on the other strand that has been pulled apart and isolated. So across from this C you put a G. Across from this A you put a T, up through the strands of DNA. What you're left with when this process is finished is two DNA molecules that are both identical to the first. Take a look at the sequences across these two strands on the left and compare them to the sequences you see here and the sequences you'll see here. You see that all three of these molecules are identical to one another in sequence. This is the essence of DNA replication. The faithful copying of one DNA molecule into two by using the sequence information on each strand to create a complementary strand to it. This is how DNA replication works. It occurs through nothing more than the simple rules of DNA base pairing. What makes this whole process amazing is that it is faithful, virtually error-free, and it occurs insanely fast. Uh, cells replicate their entire genomes in a very short amount of time, and they do it efficiently, and they do it making very few mistakes. You might remember from our last lecture that we said the human genome is 3.2 billion bases in size. So every time a human cell is going to divide, all 3.2 bases of that DNA must be copied. It must be copied faithfully. It must be copied making as few errors as possible. Unbelievably, on average, two errors are made with each replication cycle of a human cell. Now think about that. 3.2 billion bases of DNA are being copied, and how many mistakes do you make? Two. And that's the error rate with DNA repair functioning as well. We'll talk about DNA repair in the next lecture, but more mistakes than that are made, it's just that most of them are fixed. So two mistakes slip through the cracks and get transmitted to the next cell. The analogy of this would be imagine copying your course textbook by hand, letter by letter, 1,000 times. So you're going to copy our 700-page textbook 1,000 times, letter by letter. That's going to be about 3.2 billion characters. And in doing so, you made two mistakes total. It's just amazing. Because of how DNA is replicated, each time one DNA molecule is copied into two, those two new molecules of DNA contain one newly synthesized strand, but the other strand is old. This process is called semi-conservative replication, and it is because an old strand is serving as template for making the new one. It's a little bit hard to understand in words, so let's look at the figure here to make more sense of it. This is a double-stranded molecule of DNA, and here the strands are color-coded in this gold color. Now if we're going to replicate this DNA, we're going to pull these two strands apart and use each as a template to make a new.
So using those color codes again, you'll see that in the two new molecules, we actually have one old strand, which served as the template, and one newly synthesized strand that was just made. Now if we're going to replicate these two molecules into four, we do the same. We pull the strands apart and use them as template. So now we have one very old strand. See, this is the gold strand that we started with in the first place, and a new strand in green. This red strand here served as template for this round of replication, but it's not quite as old as this gold one because it was more recently made. But again, the green strand is new. Here the red strand was the template and the green is new, and here we have our other very old gold strand from up here two generations ago serving as template for this green. We do another round of replication, and we see the new strands are all in black. But we have a gold strand from three generations ago serving as template, a green strand from the last generation, a red strand from two generations ago. Every time you replicate DNA, you will be left with one previously made strand that served as template for making the new strand. That is semi-conservative replication. Before we go any further talking about how DNA replication minimizes its errors to achieve these just mind-boggling error-free rates, let's first discuss how DNA replication is initiated. How do we start DNA replication? And in that conversation, also talk about how we can generate so much new DNA so quickly. Well, DNA is obviously the information storing molecule of life, and it evolved to have that capacity because it is so stable. DNA is a very stable molecule, it can survive very harsh treatment, and it's not easily perturbed. One of the main reasons for this stability is that the two strands of DNA are very tightly interacting with each other through those thousands and thousands of hydrogen bonds which we talked about in the first lecture. Remember the analogy of Velcro. All of these hydrogen bonds between all of these individual bases serve to create a very strong force between these two strands of DNA, keeping them tightly locked together. In fact, all of these hydro bond, hydrogen bonds taken together create so much force that if we want to separate long double-stranded DNA molecules in the lab, we have to boil the DNA, literally heat it to above 100, great, 100 degrees Celsius. That high heat of boiling provides the needed energy to break all of those hydrogen bonds between all of those bases that are holding the strands of DNA together. Now, obviously, cells can't achieve temperatures this high to separate their DNA for replication. Even if they could generate temperatures that high, those temperatures would kill the cell. But we need to separate DNA in order to copy it. So the question becomes, how do cells separate their DNA without high heat if these forces of the hydrogen bonds are so great? Well, the answer is that DNA separation occurs in stages, and it starts in regions called origins of replication. Origins of replication are specific, distinct DNA sequences that are bound by initiator proteins. And what initiator proteins do is they pull or pry two strands of DNA apart, breaking the hydrogen bonds there. So here we see a general schematic of an origin of replication. And once initiator proteins bind there, the DNA is pulled apart. Now, how is this possible if hydrogen bonds are so strong? Well, remember that hydrogen bonds are not strong. Individual hydrogen bonds are quite weak. All of the hydrogen bonds taken together create a lot of force, but individual hydrogen bonds are very weak. And so breaking just a few hydrogen bonds, only in the limited area of the origin of replication, does not require a lot of energy. So when these bases are pried apart just at the replication origin, simply in that uh, localized region by the initiator proteins, it creates what's called a replication bubble, and it's given that name for an obvious reason. This is like a small bubble of single-stranded DNA in the larger context of the chromosome. And the replication bubble is the site of DNA replication. Bacterial genomes are quite s small, so they have one origin of replication. However, humans have about 10,000 separate origins of replication scattered about our genome. So let's take a moment to think about why this might be. Let's use the analogy of our textbook once again. Imagine that we have to cap copy our textbook, and our textbook is about 730 pages long. Imagine our rate of copying is 10 pages per minute. This would make it seem as though it takes 73 minutes to copy our textbook. 10 pages a minute, 73 minutes, is 730 pages. But now imagine that the limiting factor for copying our textbook is not the number of copy machines we have. That would be analogous to the number of DNA replicating enzymes. So we don't have just one. 
Instead, the limiting factor is starting points. So we have all the copy machines we need, theoretically. We just need places to start the copying process. In other words, if we had only one starting point for our textbook, let's say it was page one, we would copy the first ten pages in the first minute. And then we would copy the next ten pages in the next minute, and then the next ten, and that would take 73 minutes to copy the text. However, if we had 73 copy machines available, and 73 different starting points in our textbook, and we could simultaneously start copying the textbook at page 1, page 11, page 21, page 31, page 41, etc., and use all 73 copy machines, how long would it take to copy our textbook? One minute. We would copy all 730 pages in that one minute because we were doing simultaneous copying. That is the idea behind multiple origins of replication in the human genome. By starting the copying process of the human genome at multiple starting points, we can copy the entire genome much more rapidly. All right, so let's take a step back uh, just to kind of get back to where we were before. We have 10,000 origins of replication in the human genome. Each of those origins of replication is being bound by initiator proteins who have pried apart the DNA at those origins and created replication bubbles, which are going to be the site of DNA replication. So the next thing to happen is the actual replication process. The replication machinery, which simply means the enzymes that are responsible for DNA replication, are attracted to and bind at these replication bubbles. These proteins come together to form a huge machine, which we'll talk about in detail near the end of the lecture. But every single protein in this machine that has been recruited to the replication bubble has its own job. It's responsible for some fairly simple, single, necessary task that contributes to replication. The site of DNA replication in the bubble is called the replication fork. So what we actually see in this diagram is half of a replication bubble. So here's the replication fork, shown here. The replication fork is literally a fork in the road of the DNA, so it's a Y-shaped junction where the double-stranded DNA is being pulled apart into single strands and new DNA is being made using those old strands as template. This is a more detailed and accurate version of the replication fork, just to give you some appreciation for how damn confusing and complex it all is. We will not be going over the details of the replication fork to this level, uh, but I do want you to get a sense for just how amazing this process is in its uh, full level of detail. So every replication bubble has two replication forks in it. The forks form on either side of the bubble, and those two replication forks are moving away from each other in opposite directions. So here on the top we see a long stretch of human DNA, which has two replication bubbles in it. We see replication bubble number one and number two. And those replication bubbles have their own forks, and those forks move away from each other, one to the right and one to the left. Here in this diagram, you can see new replication bubbles have formed as well, speeding up the rate of replication. Those replication forks continue to move apart from one another until finally they join, and the entire long DNA molecule has been replicated. This means that DNA replication occurs bidirectionally. DNA replication is bidirectional. This refers to the fact that the replication forks are moving in opposite directions. In bacteria, the rate of replication is 1,000 newly added nucleotides per second. Think about that. A thousand newly synthesized bases per second is the rate of DNA replication in bacteria. The rate in human cells is a little bit more modest. It's tenfold less, 100 bases per second, which is still amazing. I mean, just count to one, and 100 new bases of DNA were uh, made in that time. The reason that human replication is so much slower than bacteria is probably due to chromatin. The nucleosomal DNA, DNA being wrapped in these nucleosomes, that has to be freed and then recondensed, slows replication down, understandably. <coughs> Either way, at the heart of the replication process is the enzyme DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase is an enzyme that is able to make new DNA strands using old strands as template. Tying back to some of the details that we went over in lecture one, what DNA polymerase does on a chemical level is it makes a new phosphodiester bond between the 5' prime phosphate group of an incoming nucleotide and the 3' prime hydroxyl group on the end of the existing chain.
So shown in the schematic, we have our old template strand in orange on the right. We're following the rules of complementary base pairing, as you can see here in the center. Our other strand is anti-parallel, and it is growing 5' prime to 3', prime, as all DNA does. And what we just said is that we are creating a phosphodiester bond between the phosphate group on the 5' prime carbon of the incoming nucleotide here, which is a cytosine, and linking it to the oxygen of the hydroxyl group on the 3' prime carbon of the previously added nucleotide. So this oxygen is going to make a bond with this phosphate, creating a phosphodiester bond as we see here. We zoom in on it a little bit just to make it clearer, and we are going to create a bond between this hydroxyl and this phosphate. That's a 5' prime to 3' prime linkage, adding this nucleotide to the chain of DNA. That is what DNA polymerase does. Individual new nucleotides enter the reaction site of DNA polymerase as deoxynucleotide triphosphates. This is a general term used to represent all four of the bases of DNA. The abbreviation for deoxynucleotide triphosphates are DNTPs, but we are truly referring to DATP, deoxyadenosine triphosphate, the A's of DNA, DGTP, deoxyguanosine triphosphate, DCTP, and DTTP. This is a uh, drawing or schematic of DATP, but if we were talking about GTP, CTP, or TTP, we would just have a different nitrogenous base up here. This is the area of the base. You might remember this is the ribose sugar, and this is the phosphates. We have three phosphates here. That's why it is a triphosphate. This is DNA, so the deoxy refers to no hydroxyl group here on the two prime carbon. Remember, DNA has been deoxified. Chemically speaking, the energy that powers the synthesis of DNA comes from the DNTPs themselves. These phosphate bonds are very high energy bonds. In fact, the energy contained in an ATP molecule comes from the triphosphates in the ATP. So the energy for replicating DNA comes from cleaving or cutting the DNTPs themselves. This bond, which is cut in order to create the phosphodiester bond we just talked about, when this bond is cut, releases a ton of energy and this energy is used to power DNA synthesis. Normally, like any enzyme, DNA polymerase would do one reaction and float away. So left to its own devices, DNA polymerase would add a single nucleotide to the chain of newly synthesized DNA, and then it would float away. Eventually, of course, it would float back and add another nucleotide, but that would have some time delay, and so obviously this is inefficient. To speed the rate of DNA polymerase, there is a clamp protein. And the clamp protein encircles the DNA. It's actually a protein ring. And what the clamp does is it interacts directly with DNA polymerase. It's also closed around the DNA, and so the clamp keeps the polymerase from floating away. This is a nice schematic of the clamp. The DNA is in blue. You see the clamp is a donut encircling the DNA, and it is directly interacting with DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase adds a single nucleotide, and then it tries to float away, but it can't because the clamp keeps it there. And so it adds the next, and adds the next, and adds the next, making it efficient. This is a molecular model of the true clamp protein. So this is based on experimental evidence. The DNA, again, is in light blue. And you can see the thing truly is a clamp, a protein clamp, which encircles the DNA. Movie 6.1 posted on Canvas shows the general structure of DNA replication pretty well. I'd like you to at least check out the first half of that movie now. And then movie 6.3, also posted on Canvas, is dedicated to showing the clamp protein itself. And so it might be useful to check that out now as well. All right, so let's go back to our replication fork, take a closer look at what's actually going on in that replication fork. Here's a very general schematic of a replication fork. Keep in mind that the DNA strands are always anti-parallel, so the strand on top is going 5' prime to 3' prime right to left, while the strand on the bottom is going 5' prime to 3' prime left to right. The DNA has been pried apart here, so we're on the left side of our replication bubble, and this DNA is single-stranded, so it can act as template. Please also keep in mind that DNA can only be synthesized 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So DNA strands must always be anti-parallel, and synthesis can only occur 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Take a look at this replication fork for a moment and tell me if you see any problems with that. You see, for the bottom strand, this poses no problem at all. For the bottom strand, we can make new DNA 
that is anti-parallel to the template strand that is following the direction of the replication fork. We start making our DNA here on the end, and we just keep making DNA, chugging along as the replication fork moves forward. The replication fork is going to continue to open up DNA towards the left, and the new DNA being synthesized will follow it. Great. But what about the top strand? See, the top strand is going the wrong way for this process, so it doesn't have that luxury of continuous DNA synthesis. For the top strand, DNA has to be synthesized in a direction that moves away from the replication fork. To be anti-parallel, we need to make DNA from left to right for the top strand, because we always have to make DNA 5' prime to 3'. Prime. What this means is that the top strand needs to be synthesized in segments. As the replication fork moves forward and opens up more template DNA, more DNA is made, but it's made in a backstitching way, going away from the replication fork. By definition, strands where DNA synthesis can be done continuously are called leading strands. Strands where DNA synthesis must be done away from the replication fork, discontinuously, are called lagging strands. The diagram on the left, I think, shows it a little bit better. Here we have a replication fork opening, and this is replication fork is on the other side of the bubble, so now the replication fork is going to be opening DNA towards the right. You can see our top leading strand is giving us no problem at all. We can make new DNA 5' prime to 3' prime from left to right using template DNA as our guide. However, to make the bottom lagging strand, we have to make a segment of DNA that starts at the edge of the replication fork and moves away from it. Now, as the fork moves forward, we keep making new DNA on the leading strand, no problem. DNA polymerase just follows behind the fork and continues laying down new DNA. But for the lagging strand, we have to make another segment that starts at the fork and moves away. The fork continues to open, and we keep ch chugging along making our leading strand. However, we need to make a third segment for the lagging strand, which moves away from the replication fork. So this is a problem for DNA. Obviously, we can't have individual segments making up the lagging strand, yet that's the only way we have to synthesize it. I've used the terms already, but to define them formally, the leading strand of DNA is the strand that is made continuously as one long molecule, whereas the lagging strand needs to be synthesized discontinuously, beginning as individual segments of DNA. And this is why the replication fork is called asymmetrical. It is made differently on its two sides. The DNA fragments or segments that are made after synthesizing the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments. That's named after the Japanese biochemist who first discovered them. Again, these segments don't remain individual throughout the life of the molecule, but this is the only way to make the DNA molecule uh, during replication itself. So these Okazaki fragments are later joined together to create one long, single, contiguous strand of DNA. However, it can't be made that way from scratch. It's also important to point out that all DNA on Earth is replicated in this way. All DNA on Earth must be anti-parallel. All DNA on Earth is made 5' prime to 3'. Prime. There's no living system to synthesize DNA in any other direction. And so with some subtle details aside, all DNA on Earth, regardless of what cell that DNA is in, is synthesized in the way we're describing here, with one lagging strand and one leading strand, both being made at replication forks, which make up half of a replication bubble. Movie 6.5 on Canvas does a very nice job of just summarizing the overall synthesis of leading and lagging strands. So that's how the DNA is made, but we said in the intro that DNA uh, polymerase and DNA replication is also self-correcting, that we have some proofreading mechanisms there. Well, we all make mistakes. Part of the natural order of life is that things don't always go as planned and mistakes are made. Life tends towards chaos, and mistakes are part of that. So DNA is no exception to that rule. DNA polymerase, as good as it is, it makes plenty of mistakes. And those mistakes largely include getting the wrong nucleotide into the reaction center of the enzyme, and then putting that wrong nucleotide into the newly synthesized DNA strand. Now, DNA polymerase makes a whole lot more mistakes than 1 in 10 million, which is its uncorrected, unprepared error rate. So if DNA polymerase makes more mistakes than 1 in 10 million, how is it possible that DNA polymerase's error rate is 1 in 10 million? Let's say that again. If DNA polymerase is making more than one mistake in every 10 million bases added, how is it that that's its error rate? 
Well, the answer is that before DNA polymerase actually adds a nucleotide to a growing chain of DNA, it goes through quite a bit of trouble to make sure it's the right nucleotide that's sitting there. So DNA polymerase makes sure that the nucleotide fits just right and base pairs just right with the template strand base that's just across it. Second, when DNA polymerase does make a mistake and it attaches the wrong nucleotide to the growing chain of DNA, it recognizes that mistake and fixes it, almost all of them, in real time before it moves on and synthesizes any more DNA. This ability of DNA polymerase to recognize an inappropriately incorporated nucleotide, remove it and replace it all in real time, is called proofreading. And proofreading occurs simultaneously with DNA synthesis itself. The DNA polymerase enzyme is constantly making new DNA and checking that DNA to make sure it was made correctly. Once a nucleotide is added to a newly synthesized DNA strand, DNA polymerase checks it to make sure that it is a perfect match, to make sure that it is fitting in there perfectly, to make sure that no mistakes were made. How does it do this? It does it by touch. You might remember from lecture one we talked about how smooth and uniform and repeating that DNA is. I even showed you this diagram to just show you the beauty of the structure of DNA. That if you don't remember, this is looking down the barrel of a DNA molecule as though we turned it towards ourselves and we were looking down on the top. A very regular, repeating, elegant structure. When the wrong nucleotide is put into this structure, it distorts and destroys this smooth, repeating pattern. And so when DNA loses its smoothness, DNA polymerase realizes it made a mistake. So it's as though you are closing your eyes and feeling along the edge of a smooth surface, feeling for any deformities. And as soon as you feel a little bump, you know something is there that shouldn't be. If the DNA feels right, if it remains smooth, DNA polymerase knows that it put the right nucleotide in and it moves on and continues synthesizing DNA. However, if the DNA feels wrong, if it's distorted, if that smoothness is lost, DNA polymerase knows that an error has been made, that the wrong nucleotide has been added. In this case, the DNA polymerase actually takes that incorrect nucleotide and shifts the end of that new DNA strand to a different region of the enzyme. Regions of the enzymes are called domains, so there's a different domain on the enzyme for this. Once that offending incorrect nucleotide is moved to the second domain in the enzyme, the phosphodiester bond is cut, and what that does is clip that wrong nucleotide off of the end of the DNA strand, leaving it one nucleotide fewer. This is a different figure that shows it in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> On the left you see we have DNA polymerase synthesizing new DNA. The darker blue strand of DNA is the template strand, and the lighter blue strand is the strand that's being synthesized. Right now, the entire process is configured around the polymerization domain of the enzyme. This is where DNA is made, and we're making new DNA as we go. However, if the wrong nucleotide is incorporated and it ruins that smoothness of the double helix, that new strand is switched and moved so that it enters the exonuclease domain, which is just a fancy way of saying the region of the protein that can cut DNA. Now please appreciate the fact that this is the same enzyme, this is all DNA polymerase. It just has two active regions, a polymerization region for making DNA and a proofreading region for clipping DNA. That incorrect nucleotide is just snipped right off the end of the molecule here, once it's been snipped off, this strand returns to the polymerization domain, and DNA synthesis goes on as normal. Once the process has been completed, the proofreading process is done, the entire enzyme reverts back to its synthesis mode, the DNA re-enters that synthesis portion of the enzyme, and replication continues. So while DNA polymerase synthesizes DNA from 5' prime to 3', prime, it proofreads from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. In other words, DNA polymerase actually backs up one step in order to clip and repair its mistake. Movie 6.1 on Canvas, the second half of that movie, does a wonderfully amazing job of showing you this in action, showing you replication and then what DNA polymerase does when it makes a mistake in order to proofread. Moving on to RNA primers, 
As impressive as everything I might have told you already is, there is a pretty nasty catch to everything that I haven't told you yet. That catch is that DNA polymerase, as fancy as it might be and as much as it can proofread, actually can't start synthesizing DNA on its own from scratch. The scientific term for that is de novo. So DNA polymerase can't make DNA from nothing. In other words, DNA polymerase doesn't have the ability to land on a single template strand of DNA and start laying down new DNA. This is because DNA polymerase has to add nucleotides to 3' hydroxyls. It needs that first nucleotide in place before it can start making new DNA off of it. So, if DNA polymerase can only link 5' ends of new nucleotides to the 3' ends of already there existing nucleotides, the question becomes, how do we start DNA replication? How do we kickstart this process? The answer is, an RNA polymerase starts this process. An RNA polymerase can make chains of nucleotides from scratch. You might remember also from our first lecture, RNA is very similar to DNA, molecularly and chemically. In fact, the only real difference we need to worry about here between the two molecules is that RNA has not been deoxified, whereas DNA is missing a 2' hydroxyl group, RNA has one. Other than that one difference and some others that we'll talk about later in the semester, there really is no distinct difference between DNA and RNA. The bases are exactly the same, uh, the linkages are the same, and so RNA is a very similar molecule to DNA. The reason why we can, cells can make RNA de novo, the reason why RNA can be laid down from scratch and DNA can't, has a lot to do with the fact that this planet started as an RNA world. That actually is referred to as the RNA world hypothesis. It's pretty conclusive now, it's pretty widely accepted that RNA was the first functional biomolecule to evolve on Earth, and it certainly came before DNA. So we see a lot of kind of artifacts and relics of this in life, even now it exists on this planet, where RNA can do things that DNA still can't, and this is our first example in this course, where RNA-making enzymes can just make RNA from scratch, whereas DNA-making enzymes can't. I'd be more than happy to talk more about the RNA world hypothesis for anybody who's interested, but you'll have to come to office hours for that. We just don't have time in the lecture. So what's important for us here is that the implication of this is that each newly synthesized strand of DNA actually starts with what we call an RNA primer, that every newly replicated DNA molecule has an RNA piece to it at the very beginning. The RNA primer, which is made by the RNA polymerase, and we call that RNA polymerase enzyme a primase to tell us that it makes primers, the RNA primer is only about 10 bases long, but that those 10 bases provide a free existing 3' hydroxyl onto which DNA polymerase can land and begin adding new DNA nucleotides. So that's shown in this diagram here. We have a template strand. It's going in the right direction. We'd like to put DNA down at the very beginning, but we can't. So in comes primase. Primase has the ability to add just about 10 bases of RNA first from scratch. And now we have double-stranded nucleic acid that DNA polymerase can bind to and make new DNA using the template strand as a guide. So everything in red down here is new DNA, but we started with a green RNA primer put down by primase. So the leading strand only needs one RNA primer. Think about that for a minute. Make sure you understand why. If you can't visualize in your mind why the leading strand only needs one RNA primer, you should probably back up the lecture and go back to the leading and lagging strand slides. But trust me when I say that the leading strand only needs one RNA primer. You start the leading strand only once, right? You only have to initiate DNA replication on the leading strand once, and then you just chug along the replication fork, following behind it as it opens new DNA. But the lagging strand, the lagging strand needs lots of RNA primers. The lagging strand is made in segments, and each segment is its own new cycle of replication. So since the lagging strand is made in segments, constantly backstitching and moving behind the fork and then replicating DNA back towards it, we need a new RNA primer for each of those segments. So each Okazaki fragment on the lagging strand represents a new round of DNA replication, so each of those fragments had to have its own RNA primer. So that's a mess. 
That means the lagging strand is not only synthesized in pieces, it is a conglomeration of DNA-RNA hybrid pieces. So how in the world can we join Okazaki fragments together to make one contiguous DNA and DNA-only strand if they are these hybrid molecules? Well, completing the lagging strand actually requires three enzymes. The first enzyme lands on the three prime end of one fragment and chews up the RNA primer that is in the fragment in front of it. The second enzyme in the process, called a repair enzyme, puts new DNA down where the RNA was just a moment ago before it was chewed up. The third enzyme is called DNA ligase, which we'll use in the lab portion of this course. DNA ligase joins the phosphodiester sugar backbone, I'm sorry, the phosphate sugar backbone of DNA, creating one long single D DNA strand. So that's shown in this diagram here. Here the RNA primer is in red and the new DNA is in blue. And we see we have one Okazaki fragment right here, and then the next one is right next to it. The very first thing that happens is that the RNA primer is chewed up and removed. Right behind that comes our repair enzyme, which is putting new DNA down in place of that RNA. See, this RNA here is four bases long. It's been chewed down to two, and we've put new DNA behind it, and now it's been chewed completely away with all new DNA put behind that. But what's represented on this figure quite ni nicely is even with all of this DNA filled in, we still have a break in the phosphate sugar backbone represented right here. And this break is sealed. These bonds are fixed with the DNA ligase enzyme. So those three enzymes join Okazaki fragments together, removing the RNA primers and making them a single strand of DNA. Alright, so we've pretty much covered all the basics that we need to know in order to understand DNA replication. But it's worthwhile at this point to kind of zoom out from all of the details and go over the big picture once more, since we have all the pieces in place, and get a general but comprehensive understanding of how DNA is replicated. So the best way to do this and understand the process fully is to simply describe everything that's happening at the replication fork. For any DNA synthesis to be possible, the very first thing that has to happen is that the two strands of existing DNA need to be separated so that they can each serve as template strands for DNA synthesis. We talked about how this process starts that was the origins of replication, or pulled apart by initiator proteins. But we never really talked about how the DNA continues to be separated as the replication forks move forward. The enzyme responsible for pulling DNA strands apart during replication, after they've been pulled apart at the initial replication bubble, are DNA helicases. DNA helicases are the point persons, the point proteins at the replication fork that lead the charge of replication. DNA helicases spin very, very fast right in front of the polymerase machinery and pull strands apart. So in this diagram, uh, the DNA helicase is shown in yellow. And it is pulling this parental DNA molecule apart into its two individual strands. So again, DNA helicase spins ridiculously fast. It uses energy from ATP to physically pull DNA apart, and without DNA helicase we would never have single strand template and we wouldn't be able to replicate DNA. Now imagine in your mind DNA helicase has blown through a region, it's pulled the two strands apart. And once it passes through that region, what would you expect to happen? Well, one of the things that could easily happen is that the two single strands of DNA, which match each other exactly, remember they were double stranded just a moment ago, would zip right up again into double-stranded DNA. The DS here stands for double-stranded DNA. And so the DNA was pulled apart by so much effort of DNA helicase, and DNA, DNA helicase zips through, and what happens? The strands come back together again, and it was all for naught. So we need a second player for this process, and the second protein player at the replication fork is called single-stranded binding protein. And I challenge you to guess from the name what this protein does. Single-stranded binding protein, shown in this diagram in brown, binds to single strands and keeps them segregated from one another, keeps those single-stranded DNA molecules from rejoining one another, kind of holds them apart, separates them, so that the work that DNA helicase did persists. So single-stranded binding protein does what its name suggests and keeps single-stranded DNA from reassociating with its other complementary strand. The next protein at the replication fork is the clamp, 
Remember, the clamp is what associates with DNA polymerase and keeps it from floating away after a nucleotide has been added. We see two clamps here, one for the leading strand and one for the lagging strand. We've already discussed what the protein clamp does itself. However, what we haven't said yet is that there is also a clamp loader. The clamp loader is an additional protein which is required to put the clamp on the DNA. The clamp loader is more amazing than the clamp itself. Here it is in light blue. The clamp loader binds to the clamp, uses energy from ATP to pull the clamp open. Once the clamp has been open, it is threaded around the DNA, and then the clamp lo loader floats away, leaving the clamp on the DNA. The clamp loader is also needed to get the clamp off of the DNA in a similar process. So for the leading strand, you only have to load a clamp once. Once you get the clamp on on one end, that molecule just chugs along synthesizing DNA until you reach the end of the molecule. However, for the lagging strand, the clamp must be removed and replaced for every Okazaki fragment that's made. So here we see the clamp again, as well as the DNA polymerase itself. This is the replication fork. The replication fork and the replication machinery includes all of these proteins which we have discussed. All of these proteins associate with one another to form a huge multi-protein complex which exists at the replication fork solely for making new DNA. If you remember in the intro portion of the lecture, I said lots and lots of proteins are needed each with their own individual responsibilities and tasks which work together to make new DNA. Well here they are. We have DNA helicase needed to separate the strands. We have single-stranded binding protein to keep those strands separated. We have primase here in light blue, making the RNA primers that we need to initiate a round of replication. We have the clamp to keep DNA polymerase from floating away from the cell. We have DNA polymerase itself making new DNA using the template strand as a guide, as well as proofreading its own work, fixing mistakes that happen in real time. I ask you now to watch movie 6.4, which is posted on Canvas. This movie is simply mind-blowing. Uh, not only do I ask you to watch it now, but we'll also be watching it in class when we meet next, and we'll be talking about all of the details. But what makes movie 6.4 so utterly amazing is it shows all of these processes happening together in real time, as if we were watching a true DNA polymerase enzyme work. We see the clamp loader, we see the clamp, we see the polymerization of DNA, the lagging strands, the leading strands, so please watch that now, but again we'll be talking about it in some detail when we begin class the next time we meet. So let's wrap up this lecture with a discussion of telomeres. Telomeres are how the ends of eukaryotic chromosomes are capped. When we talked about the problem of the leading and lagging strand, we talked about the problem of DNA polymerase not being able to make DNA from scratch, and there's one more problem we need to discuss with this process. As amazing as it is, working with DNA is fraught with its own challenges. So primase is great. We have to have our RNA primers if we're going to synthesize new DNA. But primase can only lay RNA down in front of itself. It can't lay RNA down under itself. Now, I will tell you that I'm oversimplifying things a little bit here just to make the, the material more understandable. So what I'm saying is not entirely accurate, but the concepts are true. The primase can't really lay RNA primers down under itself, only in front of itself. So who cares, you, you say, what difference does it make? Well, it does make a difference. Here again is our simple schematic of a replication fork. You should know the lay of the land by now. Uh, on the bottom is the lagging strand, so imagine that RNA primase has landed right here. It makes the RNA primer in red in front of itself, and then new DNA is synthesized in light blue from that point forward. Great, right? Nice structure. DNA is made to the very end of the molecule. Wonderful. But for the leading strand, RNA primase binds to the end of the DNA. It puts down an RNA primer in front of it. New DNA is made. Great. But now let's remove the RNA primase and see what we have. We have a gap. We have a region of the template DNA that was failed to be copied on the new strand because RNA primase needed a place where it could bind, and it couldn't put RNA down under it. So we have a gap here. We have an uncopied region of DNA.
Let's separate these two strands completely now. On the bottom we see the initial Okazaki fragment that we made up here. On the top we have our RNA primer displaced with its gap and the new DNA that we could make from it. So this new DNA can be made all the way to the end, right? And then the DNA polymerase would fall off. But let's look at our other Okazaki fragments. Primase lands here, puts a primer down in front of it, new DNA is synthesized, wonderful. Eventually this RNA would be chewed up, new DNA would be put down, and DNA ligase would seal those nicks. RNA primase binds here, puts a primer down in front of it, new DNA is made, wonderful. But take primase away, and there we go, another gap. RNA primase couldn't put DNA down, RNA down, excuse me, under it, and needed a place on the strand to land. If we allow DNA to replicate in this way only, chromosomes would shorten with each and every round of replication. Because these RNA primase enzymes need places to land and they can't put RNA down under them, we would have these gaps persist with each subsequent generation. In other words, the DNA made using this strand as a guide would be shorter still, because RNA primase needed a place to land here. This is called the end replication problem. It means that, with no other mechanisms, chromosomes would shorten with every round of replication. This is unacceptable. It doesn't take a molecular biologist to realize that given enough generations, the chromosome would whittle down to nothing. You keep shortening and shortening and shortening it, and eventually you'd have nothing to replicate. So, DNA-based chromosome caps have evolved, or they've been engineered, depending on your belief system. And what these caps do is they're added separately. They are made of DNA, but they don't rely on standard DNA replication to be made, and so they can be added after the fact. They're called telomeres, these chromosome caps. And when added, they provide a landing pad for DNA replication to be recruited. And so primase can bind to an added telomere and make its RNA primer, thereby limiting the end replication problem because the telomere is not made using DNA polymerase. The telomere is created in an alternate way. And it's important to note that bacteria don't have telomeres because bacteria don't have linear chromosomes. So bacteria don't need to worry about any of this. One benefit of having a circular genome is that there is no end to the genome. So if you've gotten to the end and there's a gap, just go back to the beginning and move the other way. Uh, in a circle, there is no end. But eukaryotic cells, which have linear chromosomes, have to have telomeres. And so the last story we'll talk about today is how telomeres are made and how they provide landing pads for primase. No surprise, the enzyme that is responsible for making telomeres has been called telomerase. So the telomerase enzyme is attracted to chromosomal ends, and it makes telomeres at those ends, creating chromosomal caps. What makes telomerase as an enzyme truly amazing, and the reason why it can replicate DNA all by itself, even to the end of the chromosome, is that telomerase carries its template strand, made of RNA, with it. Because the RNA template is part of the telomerase enzyme, telomerase doesn't need its own landing pad. It can land on its own template and make DNA to the very end. And even though that template strand is very, very short, telomerase can and does add many, many of those short cap sequences to the ends of chromosomes, creating a very large cap that is made simply of very short but repetitive DNA repeats in tandem. Your textbook's figure for telomerase, I think, is a little bit, not lacking, but confusing. It doesn't show the process as well as it could be shown. So I found this figure, which I think shows it a little bit more. What we're looking at here is the end of a chromosome, and this chromosome would shorten without a telomere. And the reason why it would shorten is because we can't make new DNA without a landing pad. So telomerase carries a sequence or a strand of RNA with it as part of the enzyme, and that sequence binds to, in a very short way, this overhang of DNA on the chromosome. What that creates is a single-stranded template strand, which is really the RNA from telomerase. 
and telomerase itself acts as a DNA polymerase, and it makes new DNA using its own RNA molecule as a guide. So the newly synthesized DNA nucleotides that are made by the telomerase are shown as lowercase letters here so that they're easier to track. Now this is a very small cap. It's made up of just six nucleotides. So what does telomerase do? It shifts, and it takes its RNA strand and moves it down a little bit. And then it makes another short stretch of DNA using its RNA strand as a template. And then it'll shift again and make another short repetitive sequence of DNA. So this is what we mean when we say that telomerase has very short sequences that it can make, but by making those short sequences many times it creates a large cap that simply contains many DNA repeats in tandem. We do this enough times and we're going to have a very long sequence of DNA at the end of this chromosome, all made up of GGTTAG repeats. But what's critically important here is more the fact that we are creating a very long and large cap on the end of the DNA chromosome that cannot and will not be shortened with rounds of replication because telomerase is able to synthesize that DNA to its very end using its own template molecule. The final movie that we've posted for this lecture is movie 6.6. .6. It's also on canvas and it does a very good job in animation of showing how telomerase extends the ends of chromosomes. So to summarize everything that we talked about in today's lecture, we started where we had left off in lecture one, saying that we can replicate DNA as long as we can pull the two strands of DNA apart and use each of those strands as its own guide or template strand, allowing a new strand of DNA to be made that follows the rules of base pairing. The old strand serves as the template for making a new strand as long as the new strand is complementary to the first. Because each quote-unquote new molecule of DNA actually contains one old template strand and one newly synthesized strand, DNA replication is said to be semi-conservative. The way this process starts is that initiator proteins bind to spe specific and distinct sequences called origins of replications, and these initiator protein um, work together to pry DNA apart at the origins of replication and create an open single-stranded replication bubble. Each replication bubble has two ends, replication forks, and the replication forks are the site of DNA replication. Replication forks move in opposite directions from one another, increasing the size of the replication bubble as they move, and so DNA replication is said to be bidirectional. DNA polymerase is the enzyme responsible for making DNA. It normally would float away with each added nucleotide, but it is not allowed to because of the clamp protein, which holds it in place. We defined leading and lagging strands, the nature of DNA being anti-parallel, but also being restricted in a 3 prime to f a 5 prime to 3 prime synthesis, means that one of our strands can be made continuously, following behind the replication fork, and we call that the leading strand, while the other strand needs to be made in segments that move away from the replication fork, they are made discontinuously, and we call those our lagging strands. The individual segments of DNA that make up the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments. We also pointed out that DNA polymerase has the ability to proofread, recognize its own mistakes in real time, recognize a misincorporated nucleotide, and remove it before moving forward. This proofreading activity occurs in a separate domain of DNA polymerase, and it moves backwards. So DNA polymerase actually moves in a 3' prime to 5' prime direction in order to proofread. One of the limitations of DNA polymerase is that it can't synthesize DNA from scratch. It can't just land on a single strand of DNA molecule and start making new DNA. And so we need RNA primers to allow DNA synthesis to occur. RNA primers are made by the enzyme primase, and once an RNA primer has been laid down, DNA polymerase can bind there and extend DNA off of that primer. Of course, these primers need to be later removed. They are chewed up, replaced with DNA, and then DNA ligase seals any nicks in the DNA backbone. We discussed what was going on at the replication fork in some general detail. We talked about helicase being the enzyme responsible for continuing the separation of DNA strands, pushing the replication fork forward. Uh, creating template strands of DNA by separating them. Single-stranded binding protein comes in and keeps those separated strands apart so that they don't re with one another and seal up again. We talked about the clamp loader protein, which is responsible for loading the clamp. 
and everybody else who's also present at the fork. Finally, we ended with a very brief discussion on telomeres. Telomeres are chromosome caps, and they help us solve the end replication problem. This is the idea that chromosome, that DNA strands of chromosomes would shorten with each round of replication because DNA primase would have no way of putting, uh, I'm sorry, RNA primase would have no way of putting an RNA primase primer under itself. So telomerase is the enzyme that carries its own RNA template strand around with it, kind of links up right to the very end of a chromosome, and makes a short DNA sequence using that RNA strand as template, and then it does it again, and then it does it again, creating a very long DNA sequence made up of short individual tandem repeats, but that long repetitive sequence of DNA made by the telomerase enzyme is the telomere, and it serves as a cap on the end of the chromosome molecule that is not subject to shortening because it's made in a way that's independent of DNA polymerase, and also made in a way that's independent of RNA primers. So that's the end of the material that we're going to cover today. Again, this was the first half of Chapter 6. In our next lecture, we will finish Chapter 6 by talking about repair and recombination. Replication, repair, and recombination taken together as a single topic are all of the things that the cell does to minimize mutations and mistakes in its genome.